Good morning. Good morning. All right, you got to remember, I'm the hard of hearing guy, so you got to kind of bring it. Okay. Hey, we are really glad you're here this morning, whether you come every single week. If you're a guest, we just want to say welcome. We are especially glad that you're here, and we want to do everything that we can to help this be a good experience for you. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask someone sitting near you or uh, tap me on the shoulder. If you have a question, we'd love to help you. Also, if you're a guest, we'd love to have you fill out a connection card uh, from the pew in front of you, the seat in front of you. I went old school there, I want a pew on you, a seat in front of you. And uh, just so that you know, here's what we'll do with that. I'll send you a text and it just says, hey, so glad you were here as a guest and we want to do everything we can to help you. But it also just gives you my number if you have a question some other time and you just want to figure out how do I get a hold of a pastor, you'll have the ability to do that, okay? Uh, I want to shift our thinking for just a moment and just kind of ask you, what do you think of when you think of worship? When you hear the word worship, what goes through your mind? A lot of us have a lot of different ideas, and I just want to kind of share with you just some broad definitions of worship. First and foremost, when I think of the word worship, I think of the, the sense of just awe. You know, that moment where just, there's just stunned silence in the room, or that moment where you almost feel just speechless as you're just in awe of something. But we express our worship in a lot of different ways. This morning, at the end of the service, we're going to express our worship uh, in our songs. We're going to express with our mouth the things that make us just feel a sense of awe about God. And we're going to express our love and adoration of him. And that's one form of worship. Another form of worship sometimes is just when we're praying and we just say, you know, God, I just am uh, so blown away by how much you love me. God, I just, I'll never get tired of thinking of everything you've done in order to have a relationship with me. Another way we worship is when we just do things out of obedience. It may not be the thing that I want to do with my time in that situation. Or it may not be that the person I want to try to love or, or treat in a gracious way. But out of worship for God and the desire to do the things in my life that he wants done, when I do that, that's a form of worship. Giving is another form of worship. Giving is not a thing that's done because, oh, the Bible tells me I have to do it, or there's a minimum amount that I have to give. Worship, when it comes to giving, should be that I want to be a generous towards God as he is toward me. And when I do that, I enjoy the giving, and I enjoy the generosity of that, and at the same time, I'm helping my heart become more like God's heart. Right now, what we're about to do is we're going to have communion. And so the thing I want you to think about when it comes to communion in respect to worship is sometimes we come to communion and we do it at a time, and, and it's not wrong, but we do it at a time to examine ourselves and just go, you know, God, i got to be honest. My, my heart has not been that pure this week. My, my thoughts have not been that pure. My words have not been very kind this week. And sometimes we do that at a time of communion, and you, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. What I want to offer you to you this morning is for you to just give yourself a few moments to let communion be completely a moment of worship for you. And here's what that looked like. Instead of reflecting on where you maybe have fallen short, let it be a time where you just sit in awe of the fact that Jesus physically went to the cross even though he could have chosen to walk through the crowd, he had done it before, but he chose to go on the cross and face that brutal killing because that's what I needed. That should just take your breath away for a moment. Or when you partake of the juice and you just think, that is literally him giving his life. He died and this juice represents his blood being spilled because of what I've done. Not because of anything he's done, because of what I've done. And just give yourself that moment to just have gratitude, that moment to just have a sense of awe. So whether it's before the emblems reach you or if you're in the front after you take the emblem, just spend a moment in worship in a sense of awe of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your goodness. Every time we think about it, if we just, uh, th there just aren't enough words to express how grateful and how blown away we are 
by the extent to which you love us. So, Lord, right now, we partake of the bread, which represents uh, Jesus' body, and the, and the juice, which represents his blood, and we fully acknowledge that physically, in every way, he gave his life for our sins so that we could have a right relationship with you. Lord, let us just have a moment of awe as we just sit and reflect on that and as we express our gratitude to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you this morning. It's been a while since I've had the opportunity to preach here in Kimball. For those of you who might not know me, my name is Ed. Uh, I see a, a lot of new faces out here, and that's a really good thing. And as I was standing in the back, I, I told this story first service, I saw a lot of new faces coming in. I mentioned that to Brian, he said, yeah, that's really great, but there's only one problem. You're not Tom. You're the JV. You've got to make sure you let them know that so they come back next week and hear Tom. So, yep, I, I am the JV today. But I'm still glad to be here. I'm still glad for the opportunity to share with you from God's Word. I want to tell you a, a story. This may come as a surprise to some of you. But I haven't always made good decisions throughout my life. And if Jack were here, and I, I was glad he didn't stand up this morning and said, hey, I can tell you some of those bad decisions, because we were kind of like side by side when I was making them. But I, I haven't always made good decisions. And one of those times, I was about 19 years old. And it was January, February. And it was a snowy day. But I decided that I needed to travel from our house, which is about 17 miles from Kimball, to Kimball. And my dad, he's like, no, nah, I don't think you should do that. I'm like, no, nah, Dad, I, I really think I should. So I was getting myself ready. And just before I left, he's like, no, you, you really shouldn't do this. And I'm like, Dad. I, I'm all right. I, I'm going to go. But you see, other than the snow, and it had been snowing most of the day, I had a broken foot. I was on crutches. So here I am. I'm going to go out, snowy evening, crutches. He thought it was a bad decision. But hey, it was Saturday night, and there was a girl in Kimball that I needed to see. Now, I didn't mention her name in first service, and maybe I'll mention it later. So I took off. My 74 Dodge Dart. Rear-wheel drive. Wide tires. In the snow. Well, I made it to Kimball. That's a good thing. Not too many problems. And after spending some time with my friend, I thought, ah, eh, maybe I should probably take off. So it was around 10 o'clock. Get ready, open the door, look outside. The time that I was visiting with my friend, it was like, oh, this could be interesting. And not only had it continued to snow, but the wind had started to blow. And it was blowing that snow everywhere. I got about uh, three miles east of South Haven, white out, hit a snow drift, off in the ditch. Like, ugh. I'm sitting there after I catch my breath. I'm thinking, oh, this is not good. This is not a good situation. And then, of course, being a guy, I'm thinking, wow, I hope my car's all right. To make matters worse, I hadn't seen a car since I left Kimball. So I'm thinking, I wonder how far it is to the nearest house. What am I going to do now? What's next? As you might imagine, I kind of started feeling a little anxiety at that point. Now, for all of you who are maybe 30, 35 and under, you might be thinking, why didn't you just pull out this and call somebody for help? Well, I got to tell you, 
we didn't have these things when I was 19. After I sat in my car for a while, I decided, well, maybe I'll try to get out. Maybe I'll try to get myself out of the ditch and try to walk and find that nearest house. But as I was preparing to try to make all of that happen, I noticed some lights in my back window. I'm like, hmm. So I started watching those lights. And sure enough, they started getting closer closer like oh wow closer and closer and all of a sudden they stopped the next thing I see is this spotlight hitting me in the eyes it was a Wright County deputy sheriff and I'm thinking great help has arrived <laughs> so he proceeds to help drag me up the ditch out of my car helps me into his squad car and takes me home Think back to last week if you were here. Pastor Tom did a great job of trying to give us a feel for what the disciples might have felt when it was just days before Jesus was going to the cross. You see, things weren't really turning out as they had thought. I'm guessing there was a little bit of anxiety, maybe the thought of, what's next? What, what am I going to do now? You know, Jesus knew what they were thinking. Jesus knew their heart. He knew the feeling of desperation that they may have been feeling. And then he does this. Out of the incredible love that he had for his disciples, he made them a promise. I'd like for us to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. We'll be reading verses 15 through 17, and we'll be looking at the New Living Version. If you want to look at the Bible uh, in the chair in front of you, it's page 1638. This is Jesus speaking. He says, if you love me, you will do what I say. Then I will ask my Father, and he will give you another helper. He will be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world cannot receive him. It does not see him or know him. You know him because he lives with you, and he will be in you. Did you catch that promise? Jesus promised another helper, who we quite often refer to as the Holy Spirit. Jesus is telling them that help has arrived. It's important for us to understand, though, that this promise was made to the twelve, but it was just not for the twelve. You see, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached this amazing sermon to thousands of people. And after preaching that sermon, many, many people were asking Peter, what must we do to be saved? And Peter tells them, repent of your sin. Turn to God. Ask Jesus to forgive your sins. Be baptized. And then this, he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, that promise just wasn't for the 12. That promise was for anyone who's willing to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He will give you the Holy Spirit. So who, who is the Holy Spirit? For a number of weeks, I asked different people to give me the first thing that came to mind when I said Holy Spirit. And it was amazing the different answers that I got. 
there were some that thought of him as this mystical being, some far off something that they, they couldn't relate to. They couldn't understand. They just didn't know who or what he really was. They found the Holy Spirit to be unapproachable. I can assure you that that's not the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised us. First and foremost, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. The Trinity is made up of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I know for some that's a hard concept to grasp. And I mentioned in first service, if you have questions and you want to know more about the Holy Spirit or you want to know more about the Trinity, just ask one of our pastors or one of our elders. And then Tom pointed out, how do they know who our pastors and elders are? So if there's a pastor or elder in here, I want you to stand up. Go ahead, stand up. There we go. So, after the service, look around. If you've got questions, you come and find one of these guys. And I'll even go a step further. Ladies, if you don't want to talk to these guys, find their wives. We've got some really, really sharp ladies that would be more than happy to share with you. As part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is in constant, constant fellowship with God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit, he's all wise. He knows the deep things of God, according to 1 Corinthians 2. In other words, he knows everything about God. The Holy Spirit knows all of the truth that comes from God. The Holy Spirit is all-powerful, and he's ever-present everywhere. The Holy Spirit is not only part of the Trinity, but he is a person. The Holy Spirit is referred to in God's word as him or he multiple times. He's a person. He's not some far-off, distant, mystical being. The Holy Spirit he has feelings. Because we're told in God's word not to grieve the spirit. And if he didn't have feelings, how could we grieve him? Some of you might be sitting there thinking, okay, so Jesus promised me the Holy Spirit. And I know a little more about who he is, but why? What does that mean to me? Why should I care about this Holy Spirit? I think most of us would agree that life is hard at times. We face difficult decisions. We face challenges in our life. There are times when we encounter hard questions that we don't know the answers to. There are times that trying to live out our faith is hard. Trying to share Jesus at times is hard. But I would like to suggest that life doesn't have to be as hard as we make it. And to illustrate that, I'm going to ask my grandson Ashton, and we've got a new volunteer for second service. First service, my other grandson Leo helps out, but we're going to have Loretta. That's right. Come on up, Loretta. We're going to help illustrate how, okay, we didn't practice this, so we're going to illustrate how these gloves represent us. And on their own, what can these gloves do? Can they pick anything up? Can they do any work? No, they, they are almost useless as just gloves, right? They can't do anything. So let's see what happens when we put something inside. Okay, Loretta, can you put your hands in this? Now 
Now, those gloves represent our lives, okay? And oftentimes, when we're faced with hard things, tough things that we want to try to do or that we feel God wants us to do, we try to accomplish these things with our own power and our own strength. So, Loretta, I want you to see if you can pick that up. That represents the hard things in life. Oh, wow, that's heavy, isn't it? Okay. Thank you for trying. You see what happens when we try to do the hard things in life using our own power? What happens? What happens? We fail. We can't do hard things with our own power and our own strength. But when we... Take, and we use the power of the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, it's amazing the hard things that we can do. Let's see if, see if we can do these really, really hard things. Okay. <laughs> you see the difference? When we try to do things, Loretta, thank you. Okay, you can go sit down. When we try to do the hard things in life, trying to use our own strength and our own power, we fail. But when we accept Jesus, when we accept the power and strength of the Holy Spirit, and we put that power and strength to work, there's nothing that we can't do. I came across some amazing numbers that shows just how intent we are to accomplish hard things using our own strength and our own abilities. <laughs> Market data estimates that the U.S. spends approximately $11.6 billion every year on these things. Audio self-help books, live events and seminars, motivational speakers, personal coaches, seeking fame and fortune. You see, we try so hard to improve our own strength, our own ability, but it still ends the same way. We still fail when it comes to doing the hard things. We need to learn that only when the Holy Spirit, the one who is all-powerful, when he fills our gloves, when he fills our lives, that's when we can accomplish what God desires. Romans 8, 26 reminds us that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Finally, let's take a quick look at what the Holy Spirit does. We've seen the promise we kind of know a little bit about him. So what does he do? If I were to tell you in just a few words what I think the Holy Spirit does, it would be he can help change lives for God's glory. He exalts Christ in our hearts. He changes lives forever. Sometimes we don't even realize how he's changing lives beyond us. Back in 1974, my dad decided that he would follow the urging of the Holy Spirit and move from down in the suburbs of the Twin Cities to a lake place on Indian Lake. In that move, that following of the urging of the Holy Spirit has forever impacted 
lives. You see, because we moved out to this area, we ended up coming to this church. We became heavily involved in this church. In fact, that girl I talked about that I had to get to Kimball to see was Sherry, my wife, of almost 44 years. Wow, 44 years. And now I have three of my four kids who are actively involved in this church. I have grandkids that are actively involved in the church. You see, because he followed the urging of the Holy Spirit to pick up and move to a place that none of us knew about, it changed countless lives, and it will change lives forever. Also, the Holy Spirit does many things in the lives of believers. John 14, 26 tells us that the Holy Spirit is our helper. You know, I talked about my bad decision of getting in the car and coming to Kimball in that snowstorm. I have to confess, I still make bad decisions. I hate to say that in front of my son, but... It's true. I still make bad decisions, and quite often those bad decisions lead me into a ditch. And you know what? I need help to get out of that ditch. But because I've accepted Christ, because I have the Holy Spirit living within me, He reaches down and He grabs me and He helps pull me out of that ditch and puts me on the right road. The Holy Spirit, he gives us wisdom. And he helps us make good decisions and not bad. The Holy Spirit helps us when we pray. Have you ever found yourself at a point where you just didn't know how to pray? You just didn't know what to pray for? That's when the Holy Spirit takes over for us. That's when he goes to God on our behalf. He helps us understand spiritual truths. And then he gives us the words to help explain those to others. Holy Spirit gives us power. He gives us spiritual gifts. And he gives us the ability to tell people about Jesus wherever we go. The Holy Spirit leads us in worship. Worship as Tom was talking about. Oftentimes, it seems we allow our worship to be dictated by fear. Fear of what others might think. Fear of how we may look to others. Fear of not worshiping the way that someone else thinks we should. But I would encourage you not to let your worship to God be dictated by anything. Anything other than the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I would also encourage you to never judge somebody else in how they're worshiping. You know, we may see some people just sit. That's okay. We may see some people just meditating on God's Word, and that's okay. We may see some people standing and just gazing at the cross. That's okay. I've seen people kneel and pray during worship. You know what? That's okay. Sometimes we see people stand with their hand raised to God. You know what? That's okay too. This morning, we've taken a brief look at the promise of the Holy Spirit. At who the Holy Spirit is and what he's done and what he does. But I want to leave you with one last visual. But I'm going to need your help. There's going to be some audience participation. But before that, I need you, or I give you permission to talk. What I want you to do is talk, think about what are some things that are difficult in life to deal with. What are things that we struggle with? 
what are the challenges that we face in life? And then after I get set up here, I'm going to ask you to tell me what, what are those things that you guys came up with. So here's your chance. Go ahead and talk in church. Ready to catch them? You ready to catch? Well, I hear a lot of talking, so you must have come up with some pretty good things. So, who's going to be not bashful and throw something out? Raising boys. Raising boys? That's going to get two. School? Okay. It's good. Loneliness. Loneliness. Oh, I like that. Self-control, hang on, what was the other one? Okay. What else? Health? Yeah, Tom said he doesn't hear well. Well, he's got a reason. I don't, but I still don't hear well. What are some other things? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Doing bad things. How about anger? Anybody have issues? Patience. Patience. I'm putting two in because I have issues. <laughs> what was that? Okay. How about jealousy? Greed. Greed, yes, greed. Grief. Grief. Pride. Trust. Trust. I'm running out of room, but we can keep throwing them out. How about gossip? How about addiction? Lying. Yeah. This glass represents our life. A life full of struggles. A life full of challenges. A life full of difficulties. But I want you to remember this. That that life, once we choose to accept Christ, once we begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit, look what happens. All of a sudden, there's no room. You see, we're filled with the Spirit. I would challenge you today, if you haven't accepted Jesus, if you haven't made him your Savior, if you haven't been filled with the Spirit, come, talk to Tom, one of the elders, myself. We'd love to talk that over with you. Our worship team is going to come, and they're going to lead us in some really, really cool worship songs. So now is your chance to worship.